it seems like everywhere I turn lately, there's always people talking about a magic cure for addiction, a magic cure for uh, alcoholism, being an alcoholic, and it gets me wondering, is there a shortcut? Did I have to go through the painstaking life I went through to end up at the bottom, go to a rehab, and then struggle for years to finally have the weight lifted of, I don't want to drink anymore. Could there have been some magic snap your fingers and we're all cured? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about the use of reality altering stuff to kind of shortcut the addiction process. Now, before we get into this topic, I know it's an interesting topic. It's a, it's a scary topic, right? I want to tell you at the outset that Terry and I are not doctors. We're not physicians. We don't know any of the doctor stuff. We're just telling you our experience as alcoholics and what it took to get sober. What we're going to be primarily talking about is what is it that these studies and research is looking at when talking about something that's going to change your reality and as an alcoholic why do i need my reality changed in the first place these are important questions and i think they have a lot to do with some misconception about alcohol use alcohol misuse any kind of use of any substance that alters your mind in any way which obviously this is a sobriety channel so we don't advocate any of that nor do we partake in any of that and we want to talk about this because i think I think at the core, what these studies are talking about is good. I think the method they're going about it, not so good. And that's what we're going to open up the dialogue about today. So, Terry, how you doing? I'm doing all right. And I did not do any of those mind-altering things to get sober. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I, when I first got sober, it was it was alcohol. And I had I had heard about it because... I love listening to Alan Watts. I like uh, Aldous Huxley's books, um, Ram Dass, all these guys. Now, if you read about these guys and the spiritual awakening and the gurus and everything like that, what you're going to find is that they all had in common the use of reality-altering substances. And, and when you read it, like you got to be careful as a sober person because you read it and you're like, hmm, maybe that might... You know, and then you're like, wait a minute, no, I'm sober. Um, and, and what I found is a lot of them, the ones that made it through, like the burnouts who are like still over there, you know, trying to figure it out, still using and stuff like that, they don't really have it figured out, but they're really happy with, you know, whatever it is they got going on. Um, the people who haven't figured out, I think there's something very important. And I think when these scientists that were studying the use of these uh, mood altering and um, reality altering substances, I think what they were trying to do is something that can be done without them. And I know for me, from what I understand, it was something that happened with me. And I know when I read uh, Alcoholics Anonymous book, Anonymous, weird name, um, I know when I read that book, it talks about something called a psychic change. I'm like, wait a minute, okay. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on now. I see these guys from the 60s that, that maybe, you know, had this issue, then had some kind of psychic change or awakening, and now they don't need to use it anymore. So we kind of want to unpack this. Terry, reel me in here and tell me your thoughts and, and kind of what your thoughts are on this whole thing. Well, I think the, the psychic change to get sober is a necessary thing. We do have to change our, our thinking. Um, I had to go through a, a big change, and uh, that was to, I mean, to put it simply, that was going from being self-centered and really thinking about myself and making myself feel good to, to not being so self-centered and working on, working on, you know, well, maybe helping other people and things like that. but. Um, really, uh, the, the, the core to it is, is I had to put sobriety as my top priority, no matter what. And if I, and I had to realize that if I was to take a drink, my sobriety would be gone. I'd continue to drink and I would just spiral back downhill. And so that was, that was a key thing for me. As far as the, the 
um, mind altering substances go. Um, I think that's one of the things that they're trying to address there. Uh, there's there's been uh, several studies on it, but um, the studies do not show a hundred percent or even a, a super high success rate. And percentages, um, they're, they're, it's really difficult to decipher percentages because, well, first of all, what you know, there's lots of questions that I have with a lot of these studies. Like, did they really use um, pure, real alcoholics, or was it a heavy drinker? That's the first assumption that they don't mention. They say that they were using people with alcohol use disorder. Well, what, what severity was it? Mm -hmm. And then um, there, there's other statistics as well that they put in there that, uh, you know, 50% uh, of the people uh, reduced their alcohol intake. Well, I know for sure from my personal experience that if I had reduced my alcohol intake, it wouldn't have worked. I be, would go back to drinking an excessive amount. I proved that to myself many, many, many times. And so that, that's, that was another thing that I questioned in these studies. And it's, you know, there, there were some other things. I'm just going to look over here real quick at some of these things that they were talking about. And, um, you know, they're, they're saying that even, the, even some of the people that were taking the placebo drug, they had also reduced. Um, one, other, one other factor that was, I was thinking about when I was reading this is, are these people that really, really want to quit? I had to get to the point where I absolutely wanted to quit. The next thing I was going to lose when I was drinking was worth more than the bottle. And that's one of the things that, that a lot of us have to get to that point of just this demoralization, this, this low, low bottom that we, that a lot of us have to hit. And that's where I had to get. Now, if you're kind of on the fence as to whether you want to quit drinking or not, then you see the study and you're like, oh, well, half of the people moderated. That's what I want to do. That's what I, and that's what I wanted to do as well when I quit drinking was I just wanted to moderate. But then I, it, you know, and I kept on trying to moderate and moderate, and it didn't work. Eventually, I realized that I had to stop altogether, even if it was only for a while. I, yeah. That's that's how I had to start. And I, I think it's interesting too because I never thought in a million years I would get to the place where I didn't care about alcohol. Like that wasn't. I, I thought, okay, sobriety is me fighting the will to use for the rest of my life. That's what I thought sobriety was. And, you know, that alcoholic obsession of get me better any way possible so I can keep drinking. Well, that in and of itself is not better, right? Um, and, and when we look at it, so when we look at like Terry's life or my life or a lot of other alcoholics that I've talked to and known over the years, what I see is our current way of viewing the world had failed us. Whether it was our identity, our work, our way of life, our way of being, we were in a rut that probably started somewhere before alcohol, but alcohol put like an entire gas truck on the fire and, and made it way bigger. Like these problems would not be there without alcohol. And so what happened was we got lock stepped into the role of this is what my life has become and I need to drink. Then chemical dependency kicks in and now you're effed right you are absolutely messed up and so what needs to happen well first of all i could tell you the first three months of sobriety were not great right i mean they weren't bad but they weren't great it was i want to drink but i can't and i had to learn new things now somewhere along the line because I, you got to remember here's a guy who a month before sobriety, or like the day I went into rehab, the day before I went into rehab, I was 51 50 threat to myself, not good. Not good at all. Just terrible and alcoholic. So that was my current way of thinking. Now, when alcoholics come to you and they're like, welcome to the thing, uh, you know, get rid of the stinking thinking, haha, <laughs> cute. It, it's deeper than that. The word stinking thinking is like, you know, calling a... a seizure, you know, uh, 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 nothing. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not nothing. That's a big thing. 
And so we look at this and we're like, okay, so what was the change there? How did I go from that to a couple years later, absolutely loving life, even though a lot of the problems didn't change? The outside yep. stuff did not change. Something in here changed and here changed. And so that is where long-term sobriety takes root. And I think what they're trying to do with these reality-altering things, and from what I've heard, I, I'm not an expert, never partaken, but from what I understand, it sounds like the people who get it, like there's some people that are like, yay, I'm a dinosaur, right? And they walk around and they're like, no, you're not a dinosaur. Go sit down in 12 hours, then you can talk to me. All right, so there's dinosaur people, and then there's people who somehow, some way, the reality-altering experience makes them completely see life in a different way and understand that the things that were worth drinking over no longer matter because they're not really real. And the people they're fighting with are part of the same community and we're all part of the same thing. And so when I hear people that have that, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Terry read more on the studies, I think that's what the, the scientists doing this is trying to copycat or shortcut is, hey, if you could see the world this different way, everything will start to change. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly what uh, they're trying to do, is and that's what has happened with some of the people in the study is they did change their perspective on things. Um, the one caveat with this with these studies, <clears throat> now they say um, taking this mind altering substance and professional therapy, so that's one huge thing. So never go out and try to do this stuff on your own. I, I mean, I, I was. When I was trying to quit drinking, I tried all sorts of stuff on my own and nothing worked. The most important thing is, is you go see a doctor and somebody who knows about addiction and, and getting over addiction and go from there and follow what they suggest. That is the most important thing, um, that you have professional help because it needs to be in a, in a, under medical supervision because, you know, my, my thinking, even now, my, my, I don't think my thinking would, would be the best thinking for my health. You know, I, I do think, I, I still eat pizzas, I, I still eat badly, you know, things like that. But uh, that, that's an important thing. But um, yeah, for, for me, uh, something like that, it, as Marcus has said a couple of times, it seems like a shortcut to me. And the, the issues I have with uh, something like this is that the they, they talk about success rates. Well, what about the failure rates? For me, I'm trying to do, for my sobriety, I have to not take a drink 100% of the time. So I need to do something that I know is going to work, or at least I, I have a really good idea that it's going to work. And the way I've found that is by following what other sober alcoholics are doing. And then I try to do what they do and what they did to get sober yeah. and uh, these these things that we're talking about are studies so how do they have any long-term studies or anything like that I don't know you know and I mean we can talk about success rates for any of these other programs as well but really how accurate are those success rates I well, mean, I, nobody go ahead I, I think it's interesting because you know I, I've studied this a lot and apparently my keyboard had the film on it still there you go. Um, I studied this stuff a lot, and it was interesting because I get the point. I get the idea. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Leary was around in the 60s. Uh, he had the same kind of thing. He was friends with uh, Ram Dass. They both got kicked out of Harvard. Um, Al Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, all these guys. And surprisingly, um, our guy in rehab knew some of the people in this community. Um, benefit of going to rehab near San Francisco. And so we look at this and we're like, okay, so they had this idea and we have to perspective this. 
Okay, so here's a handful of people who had a psychic change from this, this thing, this stuff. And they get on the bandwagon. Timothy Leary was like, I'm going to go across the country and everyone needs to be woken up. And I'm like, okay, I've spent some time on the hate in San Francisco. And, you know, you got to go looking for people that have had psychic chains and wake-ups and stuff like that. It's not, it's not the kumbaya, you know, uh, enlightened kind of stuff that you would think would happen if the studies were right. If the studies were right, everyone that was in the 60s would now be, they wouldn't have turned into the yuppies, right? You remember that? You had the 60s, and then they, they all went and got jobs. They were like, hey, you need to shave and get a job and become a product, uh, productive member of society. And that's what they did. And then they bought houses in suburbia, and then they you know, gave birth to Karens and all these people that are <laughs> uptight, right? And we look at this and we're like, well, where's the psychic change? Where is this? It's like the guy in the back of the AA meeting who is pissed off because he wants to drink. I've been sober eight years, but I want to drink. I hate my life. I wish I could drink. Okay. I don't think that's really the goal. Right? And when we start to understand, if you push through long enough, you will see life in a different way. Yeah. It's, it's inevitable. Right? It's kind of like, bring your ass and your mind will follow. It's going to happen. You can't go one place without the other. It just follows you, right? And so we start to understand what is it that is going to bring about that change. I think for me, it was fighting the urge to drink. Tooth and nail. No matter what, I'm not going to drink. That got my mind back to normal. And then, you know, I started to look at things different. I listened to different talks every day. Because I figure, if I'm sitting here talking to myself in my head all the time, all I'm thinking about is my thoughts. I need to get out and, and put some new stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and, and we start to understand that life doesn't revolve around our wants. People, all the time, I, I would say it's probably the number one question we get, uh, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, is... What do you do about cravings? Yeah. What are you going to do about cravings? And the answer is, not a damn thing. Nobody said that you are the king or queen and you need to get whatever it is you crave at that moment. Sorry, sometimes you can't have what you want. Yeah. And you sometimes know? It, it's not that easy. Yeah. But you just have to... You have to fight through them. Now, um, as far as the cravings go, I, I do, I do have tools to help me with those cravings. Um, I don't really have cravings anymore, but uh, I can sure, I can sure walk into a restaurant, see some fancy looking drink, and and look at it and think, wow, that sure does look good. I mean, that can happen, absolutely, and it does happen. But uh, I. I have other tools, uh, and, and really it, those tools come from that change of perspective on life. And that, and that happened pretty early in my sobriety. I was very fortunate. Some people it doesn't happen so quick. But now I can be grateful for this sobriety. And that's one of those tools. It's just simple gratitude for what I have in sobriety and what I've been able to do in sobriety. And have I you know, become the rich, famous guy? No, not at all. But I have, but I have a... a some serenity in my life and I don't have those crazy things happening those crazy things that I have to run away from and uh, it looks like some of you have experienced some of that I mean entrepreneur names I think this is your first time on live at least maybe not but um, two years for you that's great and then uh, who uh, so Andrew said uh, 46 days right on and good to see all you regulars here Grim and Trek and Dave and and uh, and uh, Grim and Neil, Neil was up there early, and then uh, Ben, of course, Ben's always here. Good to see you all. Thanks for your comments. But um, as far as, the, for, for me, um, and this is what our program talks a lot, a lot about, is changing that perspective and, and learning to look at life in a different way. And that's, that's what I have to do 
and that's what I had to learn. It's not something that comes right away. It's not like a snap of the fingers and I'm looking at life differently. It's something I had to be conscious of. And, you know, it's just like the cravings. We're very conscious of cravings, and especially in the beginning of sobriety, because they're there. And they're, they're real, even though they're in the mind. But it's something I had to be aware of. And I had to be aware of doing those things, like getting out there and going on a bike ride or a walk or a hike or something like that instead of sitting there dwelling on the fact that I'm craving something or going and hanging out with other sober alcoholics or calling another sober alcoholic and tell him what's going on or being honest with my uh, loved one about the way I'm feeling you know and that that can open up a lot of uh, those sober thoughts and thinking in the right direction yeah and you can uh, if you have a craving go get a water nice cold yeah. water Yep. By the time you're done with the water, you'll feel a little bloated and probably be okay. Like, it's a 15-minute rule we talk about all the time. And Terry was talking about, uh, you know, he, he's at a restaurant, he sees a fancy drink. And I noticed a trend when I go out to eat now, and maybe Terry can shed some light being in the restaurant industry. But I think this is part of the cause of inflation. We sit there, and and, you know, they always go through their little spiel, and they're like, would you like one of our handcrafted cocktails? And, you know, I, I look at the thing, and it's like handcrafted cocktail, you know, $21. I wait. <laughs> Back when I drank, they were 9 bucks, but now that they're handcrafted, which, correct me if I'm wrong, don't you have to make every cocktail handcrafted? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like... But, you know, if they could slap another 9 bucks on for the hand... Like, there's a guy back there whittling wood and making your cocktail, you know? Uh, yeah, I don't know, but, um, at any rate, uh, was that, is that something new or was that around when you were, uh, doing the restaurants? Uh, no, I've never seen anybody whittling wood to make a drink. <laughs> <laughs> what about the handcrafted, uh, um, cocktails? You know, the boutique, uh, the, what, what you make me think of is the boutique bars and a lot of those I catered in, uh, in sobriety. Yeah. And, um, they, they they do a lot of uh, mulling of things and adding special little little flavorings and um, and a lot of shaking of the sh of the martini shakers and all that. Yeah. And um, I think it's it's they they have kind of evolved over the past decade or so. But uh, the fancy fancy stuff um, is fairly recent, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I've just noticed it. I don't know if it was like a Florida thing or you know. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, though. It's funny because it makes you think. You're like, oh, a hand cry. I don't know if I've ever had it, you know? But And, and this is not uh, on the topic we're talking about at all. But one really cool thing is, is and this is, this is something that's neat, but I would, wouldn't recommend it for somebody in early sobriety to go out there to the bars and try these non-alcoholic ones or whatever. That's not something I would do, but I catered in these bars. Um, and so... A lot of times they'd say, hey, you want, what do you want to drink? And usually I'd just be like, hey, can I get a club soda or a Pellegrino or something like that? And they'd be like, yeah, no problem. And that's always cool because, you know, the bartender, they don't care if you're drinking alcohol or not. Or sometimes they'd say, hey, I'm making this new thing. And I'd say, can you make one without alcohol? And they'd make one for me. Mm -hmm. And it'd be wonderful. So that's, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. That's something so, that in, I would definitely wait. I waited five years in sobriety and I wasn't like waiting. It just so happened at my five years, Heineken came out with a zero and I was like, well, there's zero in there. There's nothing. Um, and I started, you know, uh, with that and I've been having those for like three years and I don't miss alcohol. Actually, what I missed was the variety from like sparkling water, Coke, tea, and I don't know what else you got, right? And now I have a variety of like, oh, I can get this non-alcoholic craft beer, or this or that. Uh, mocktails, I know in Orlando they have a full mocktail restaurant. Um, the restaurant we went to Monday, I think they were counting on everyone drinking because sky high prices, terrible food. T like, just not even worth it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, back to our topic of the change. Um, 
the way that I view the world now is vastly different. Yeah. Um, and it's a good different. Not everything is a life threatening thing where it used to be. I mean, used to be, you know, they raise the price on this or uh, like right now I'm making a decision to get an office for my other business and it's stressful. I mean, anytime you're like committing to anything that's more than a day, it's pretty stressful. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about it and I look at the difference between when I was drinking and now it's night and day. I mean, the way that you make decisions and view things and calculate, it's so much better. And the way that I view people, you know, it's like, hey, that guy, not everyone is out to personally mess with my day. Right. They used to be, or in my mind, they used to be. Now I'm like, hey, that guy's just, you know, like you get cut off on the highway and a guy going 80. They're like, hey, he's probably, maybe his wife's pregnant. I don't know. Maybe they're going to the doctor. He clearly needs to go 80 more than I need to, to go 70, so let him buy. You know, whereas before I'd get all mad and, oh, that guy, what does he think he's doing? And I'm here and I'm this. And, you know, it, it really does give you a calmness and a rational way of thinking, uh, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, well... And, and what we're talking about with that change of perspective, it's something that doesn't happen right away. Um, RMG is mentioning that, you know, you're you're struggling, and you had so seven years sober, so you know what it's like to stay sober. It's and um, it's for many, it's not an easy thing, especially when things happen. Like for you, you had a, your mother passing and a bad relationship, and it's tough and, and a lot of times uh, that's what will cause people to relapse or that'll be one of the factors of relapse and um, it's it's difficult to just suddenly I'm gonna change my perspective you know it's something we have to work on what what you're if you're really struggling and you really really want to quit it's it's doctor time in the beginning I could I couldn't do any of this thinking about um, the psychic change to change my perspective on things. I had to get the alcohol out of my system. Then I had to start to learn this stuff slowly and just kind of let it sink in. And that's that's a difficult part. It's it's a really difficult transition from that point of drinking and to that sober point and then starting to work on your life. You know, when we're drinking, we get this uh, super fast, you know, relief. And so that's what we want. We've been drinking for so long that, that, you know, every I want everything now. I want it to happen right away. And in sobriety, sometimes it just doesn't work that quickly. It sometimes takes quite a while. And, I mean, we've had people on, on these these uh, YouTubes that are, you know, they're you know a year or two in and they're still having some difficulties. And you know, and that's that could be just because of life. You know, life sometimes is not easy. And for me, that's the case. You know, it can be the case right now. I've had diff difficult times this past year. But um, it's uh, really the, that point that I'm trying to make, RMGs, is, is as I think uh, Dave said it, or uh, somebody right here. I've, anyways, uh, go to a doctor. Yeah. That's going to that's gonna really help you get started. Yeah, I think and it that's was... the one. That, oh, before I, before you go, that, that's a, um, before you talk. That... That's the one thing that uh, I think it, with with these studies that we're talking about in anything you're going to do, it's super important that you have to realize that you are responsible for your sobriety. You have to do it. You have to be completely ready. I'm, and I mean, maybe you're not super super ready, but you have to be willing to do whatever it's going to take to yeah. get sober. And that's that's the important thing. There is not a pill you can take to just change everything. Yeah, it's got to be you. It's got to be in here, and that's what they're trying to uh, discover with some of these studies. Well, I think a lot of it. Before I get to Danny's comment, is the way that I used to view anxiety. I remember I was just messed up. I was drinking, and I went to a therapist, and she's like, "You have anxiety." And then it was like magic. It was like all over me, and it, it, my life was about anxiety because she said it. It's the only reason. Um, and so I go through life, and I'm trying to battle this anxiety, and I don't know what's wrong with me. 
and she's sitting there going, nothing's wrong with you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? People don't feel the way I feel and act the way I act. There's something wrong with me. And so I went through years dealing with just crippling anxiety. I remember one time my wife wanted to go for a walk to get the mail, which our mail was on the end of the street, which was like literally a hundred yards away. And I couldn't go. My knees started buckling. I'm like, I got to go home and drink. And I went home and drank and she went for her walk and then came back. And it's funny because I never thought anxiety would go away. Not in a million years. I thought this is a curse I'm stuck with. I, I had talked to my dad um, before he passed and, you know, he dealt with anxiety. He did, I believe, have the psychic change we're talking about. Um, unfortunately for him, it was a terminal illness that brought that about. Um, but I watched the change uh, happen. And it was like, wow, he's a different person. He views things different. And I had talked to him about anxiety because he had anxiety his whole life, his entire life. And here he was, 67 years old, 66 years old, with this complete change. And we're like, this is not the dad we grew up with. This is a wonderful, great, awesome version. Um, you know, he was great before, but this is like the bonus feature, you know? Um, and it's the same thing where I thought I was going to live with anxiety forever. He thought he was going to live with anxiety forever. But somehow, some way, the change happened in his life, and he was like, why am I anxious? In the grand scheme of things, in all probability, the doctor gave him five years to live. He's going to sit around and be anxious over what someone thinks of him. It stopped mattering. Yeah. And that's what I believe is the miracle they talk about for people that really get it. For people that really get it and get to a new way of life that is kind of effortless. It, it, it doesn't mean not challenging, but it means effortless. And does that make sense, Terry, where it's like, we have challenges, we have difficult things, but it's almost as if we surprise ourselves how effortlessly we get through them. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. no. no, go ahead. Well, I was just, I was just going to say that that's, that's uh, one of the, the, uh, wonderful things about sobriety is now I can let things happen and I can, uh, instead of reacting to things right away um, I can kind of see where they go, kind of think about which direction do I need to go to solve this problem or issue or, or whatever it is just kind of think about the, the best way to do it. So I'm able to take a pause now and when I was drinking it was something bad happens i need to react to it right now this is how i'm going to do it i'm going to react to it aggressively and and you know knock this sucker down that's that was kind of my attitude and in a, it well maybe it did work here and there but it wasn't nearly as successful as just kind of letting life happens and that's that's what um makes it so effortless now and makes sobriety i wouldn't say effortless but uh it makes sobriety um easier as time goes on because it you know, I still want to take some of that uh, self-will back and uh, try and drive life and drive my life and try to, you know, make other people do what I want them to do. That that still comes and goes. But um, the more I learn to let go of those things and only control what I have control over, the easier life is. That's yeah. just, It's just a wonderful thing about sobriety. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you read these studies... And you hear these people talk about stuff. Sometimes you're like, huh, is there something to that? But for me, when I put alcohol off the table, everything was off the table. Yeah. Everything. I'm even cautious if I get stuff from the doctor. I'm like, hey, you know, is there an alternative, non-addictive alternative? Sure. Um, you know, and you start to realize, like, the question would be, and I don't know. I mean, if you asked me this question when I was drinking, I would have I would have chosen moderate, in all honesty. But the question is, is do you want the life that is the new way of looking at life, or do you do you just want to drink and keep doing what you're doing? And and in all honesty, I, I didn't know better. I had to have the downfall. I had to have 
things happen exactly as they did because I was so stubborn that I thought I had life handled. I thought I knew what I was doing. It was just everyone was in my way. And if I could not get drunk, which I get drunk because everyone's in the way, right? That's how I thought. If I could just not get drunk long enough to get rich, then everything would be solved. And if you had, like, I remember um, my therapist at the time, she brought this, um, this Zen monk guy. And she's like, you need to, you need to listen to this guy. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I got to get back to work. And this guy had a stutter and I'm like, I don't have time to listen to this. And I look at it now and I'm like, what a complete ass I was. That guy probably had the answer I was looking for right in front of my face, but I was too stubborn to get it. And I was worried about which bar I was going to go to on the way out. And, And I think... That's why you, it's like it's like lottery winners. Most lottery winners go broke within a couple of years because they're trying to shortcut it. They don't know what to do. And I think it's probably the same with a lot of this stuff. I'm sure some people do. I mean, there are some lottery winners that make good on it. Um, but I think I think for me, I'm glad I went the route I went. I'm glad I didn't take a shortcut, and I appreciate every minute of my sobriety because I worked so hard to get it. And because I worked hard, it was rewarding that the psychic change was automatic. I didn't go, it's, it's one of those paradoxes where if you want to find comfort, relaxation, and a new way of thinking, you can't find it by looking for it. Can't be found. Right. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's like muscles. You can't get muscles reading books and thinking about muscles. I know the self-help people are, you are what you think about. Really? Really? Yeah, let, let's think that through. Because I know a lot of people who would be completely different if they were what they thought about. So that stuff is not so much true. And we have to remember that self-help and a lot of the doctors, and a lot of not the doctors, but a lot of these studies... A lot of this stuff was born out of a consumer culture. And when you get deep in culture, you can't see. It's like trying to describe water to a fish. It's like, what do you do? Water. (laughs) You know what you're talking about? Water. You know? He doesn't get it because he lives in it. We don't get it because we live in it. And when we start to understand that life is so much more than money and what I think and those who have wronged me and those I've wronged and this system that I've built and dare I say my alcoholism life's bigger than that and once we understand that things start to change Uh, Danny says it's been almost 48 hours since I had a drink my stomach was nauseous for two days I don't want to ever feel like that again Danny I'll, I'll, I'll caveat that one definitely go to a doctor you're in detox. It is not safe. If Terry didn't go to a doctor, we wouldn't have a Terry on the show. Right. Um, second, I've been where you're at more times than I'd care to admit. What it's known as is the feel bad hangover. I'm never going to drink again. And sadly, our alcoholism is so, so much stronger than that. I remember trying to will myself out of a hangover so many times. Yeah. And it didn't work. I had to completely get alcohol off the table and make a resolution that no matter what, no matter how I feel, after going to the doctor and detoxing, I'm not going to drink again. No matter what. Right. And, and, what, and what Marcus is saying is go to a doctor... Go to a, you need to go to a doctor now rather than wait. I remember when I was trying to get sober, I was I was like, <clears throat> I'll go to a doctor. I got sober up first, and then I'll go to a doctor. Because <laughs> I didn't want him to know I was drunk. I mean, that was just crazy thinking. Yeah. Uh, I ended up that not being the case. I, I went when I was completely wasted, and they got me on the road to recovery. So, yeah. Dangerous stuff. Yeah. And I think it's... Patience is key, 
but not just any patients. Patients with the open-mindedness that I could be wrong. Because for me, I was such a staunch ass about how right I was about everything that I didn't listen to anyone. And I remember my rehab counselor, he said, don't be picky about where you get your truth. And I remember at that time I was studying um, this guy, Warner Earhart, who my dad liked back in the 80s. He was the founder of the S training, E-S-T. And their idea was kind of similar. It's like, okay, let's get a bunch of people in a room for, in a hotel room, and let's make them face the craziest stuff. And then at the end, when they're all anxious, tell them, it doesn't matter. That's the idea. You're going to have an awakening because you'll be like, okay, you're at the heightened thing and now it drops off. And I remember studying this guy and, and uh, my therapist had taken me there and she's like, go to this meeting. You need to go to it. And I, I was like, okay, I know this. This is this reeks of this Warner Earhart guy uh, and it's a cult. Okay, well, fine. A lot of people say AA is a cult or this is a cult and whatever. I don't even know what a cult is, but what I do know is sometimes some whack groups or people you might think do not jive with you have the answer you're looking for. The S training had the answer. The way of going about it, yeah, okay. I don't know. Well, you know, to each his own. These uh, studies, they might have an answer. Way about going about it, yeah, not, not so sure. And when we look at that, what was it that made me open to listening to people that I thought were lunatics before. Well, it was a complete surrender to the fact that everything in my life brought me to the mental hospital, 5150, gone down the road, gone. And it's interesting because Terry last week, he said he went to the Roger Waters concert I went to the one, too. Um, I don't know if you remember the part where he was talking about uh, his psychic change, which was interesting. And I, I think he went on to continue using what he used. I, I, I don't know. But I do know he had a psychic change, and he describes it as everything in the world became so small. And I know there was, a, there was something he wrote about it. And it was part of the, the, I think part of it was the Lunatic on the Grass song, which is about newspapers, and some others where he was talking about uh, Comfortably Numb, uh, where he says, there's no pain, you are receding. What does that mean? There's no pain, you are receding. When he says receding, he means he's kind of melting into life. What is? Everything. Not being, this is what I want, this is what I need. He's receding into life, accepting things for what they are, becoming part of whatever it is we're part of, right? And we, when we start to understand this, we can kind of see it in a lot of places. Sometimes it doesn't look like what we have. Some people have a change and they continue to drink because they were never alcoholics and that was never the issue. Um, unfortunately for people like me, I had to have a complete psychic change and a complete drinking off the table because... That's what I needed. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at because a lot of people are trying to get you there and some people are trying to get it there and they don't know what it is. Like I'm sure a lot of doctors, maybe they don't really know what the end result is that's going to make this long-term I now see the world different and therefore I don't have to drink. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to have to ask, answer one question. Uh, David, you said, hey, Terry, again, just asking how old were you when you got sober? Did you consider those drinking years as wasted or part of the process? Well, I've been sober for eight years, so that puts me at uh, 25 years old when I got sober. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to tell you my age on air here, but uh, you can guess. But I have been sober for eight years. Um, did you consider those drinking years as wasted or part of the process? Huh, I never really looked at them either way. I do not look at my years drinking as wasted or wasted life or even, uh, but maybe part of the process, I could say it's part of my journey of life. Uh, I don't regret 
um, the life I've led, I've had a lot of good times and a lot of enjoyable times and, and lots of things that I uh, that I get to look back and remember on. So I've been uh, very lucky or blessed or however you want to look at it. But uh, sure, there's been difficult things in life and uh, many of those things were caused by me. And are there things that I regret that happened and that I caused? Absolutely, yes. But uh, I still look at my, my life as uh, that's a good thing. It's okay. So anyways, that's my answer. Absolutely. So yeah, I think, uh, I think this was a good talk today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I think uh, the main thing is just look at look at getting through life sober first. Take alcohol completely off the table and start to do like Roger Waters said, recede into life. Let things happen. The basics of the serenity prayer. What can I control? What can't I? A lot of us, we don't want to admit it. And I remember when I was drinking, I had an addiction counselor and she's like, you're a control freak. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> if I look back on it, okay. I was trying to control the fact that she thought I was a control freak. Absolutely. Um, and why did I care? Because I was a control freak. Uh, am I still? A little bit. Do I laugh at it now? Yeah. And I think life is the ability to laugh at the things that are laughable. Yeah. Um, there's a great talk by Ram Dass. I think it was called Beyond Success. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and he talks about the change that happened with a young couple with a kid where the woman was diagnosed with a terminal illness and they were they were like wealthy as, as you can imagine. They were rich. And they were in a fast-paced life and, and they realized that, wait a minute, all this stuff we were building means nothing in comparison to the fact that now my wife is sick. Now this happens. And I think if we can start to look at life that way now I think it's a lot better way of living in my opinion, I enjoy it where it's like, hey you know what, anything can happen I don't I don't control anything everyone's out there, oh you gotta vote for this, you gotta do that really? does it really matter? I mean we all voted for someone else last time and you know, you could have voted for no one and it's gonna be the same outcome I, I don't believe in the system very much but uh, a lot of us think that what we do has such an impact and it's not much different than people who used to do the rain dance and say, look, it rained. I remember years ago, uh, there was a friend of mine who, uh, schizophrenic, mentally ill, nice guy. I was trying to help him out back when I was a preacher and I'm sitting in the car with him. I'm, I'm 19 years old. And all of a sudden I look over in the car and he's going, and I'm like, this guy's having a, this guy, I need to get to a hospital. And he keeps doing this over and over. I'm like, what do, what do we need to do? Do I need to jump start you? What, what's going on? And all of a sudden, he comes out of it. He does this about five, six times in a row. Just, and I'm like, bro, you good? He's like, yeah, I'm changing the light for you. See, it worked. We get to the next light. He <laughs> does it for three minutes. It worked. And every light, this guy was convinced that his mind changed the light. Did it? Nope. Life's going to change whether you're there or not. Sure. Life's going to happen whether you're there or not. All this stuff's going to happen. And the best thing that I got from sobriety is the blessing that I don't matter as much as I thought I did. I'm one of 8 billion people. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't need to be the richest guy, the best guy, the most admired, the one with 50 books. If I want to write 50 books, that's good. Between you, me, the wall, and Terry, I'm still working on one book, and I got one chapter left to go. <laughs> it's the Talks Over book. Um, but, you know, you, you start to realize that it's okay to just be you. Yeah. And Acceptance. Yeah. What I've had to learn to do is just accept what's going on. Yeah. I, that doesn't mean just accept what's going on and be good with it. I can still make changes. Sure. And I can work in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. But accept the fact that uh, where I am right now is uh, 
because of what I've done in my life experiences and what that's that's it I, I accept that well a lot of us are running through life like that guy with the lights yeah lights gonna change whether you like it or not right you could stress yourself yeah. out and freak out the guy driving you around <laughs> or you could put your seat back put your feet up relax enjoy the music enjoy the ride might not go the way you want light might not change exactly when you want it to but no manner of rain dances is going to make it rain the rain comes and goes and i think there's a there's a beatles song that was taken from the bible ecclesiastes it was talking about to every to everything there's a season turn turn was it the beatles that sang that uh yeah yeah okay um, all right i think so yeah and uh you know, a time to cry, a time for this, a time for that. And it's going to happen no matter what. I can guarantee you that after autumn, it's going to be winter. I can guarantee you after that, it's going to be spring. Now, it might look different. Terry's up in the northwest. He's, it's going to be a bunch of snow on his head. It's the birds. There you go. Here, we're going to have no, to... The bird. <laughs> no, the, the birds the, wrote the song. The birds, okay. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. The birds wrote it. Um, you know, so Terry's going to be making snowmen. I'm going to be making sandman, you know, oh, out yeah. here in Florida. That's cool. You know, he can listen to snow songs. Uh, I guess I'm stuck listening to Metallica if I'm making a sandman. Or I could listen to the 50s song, Mr. Sandman. You know, there you go. But uh, we start to realize that life is what it is. And no matter what. And just to give you an idea of the change that my dad went through uh, later in life. I remember one time when I was a kid, um, he was trying to get us the, the pep talk because he's a realtor and he wanted to you know teach us all how to make money. And he did a good job with, with most of us. And uh, actually all of us, I think he did a pretty good job with. And uh, one time he came in and, and we had this buddy from Arkansas who was like, never really went to school or anything. And uh, he was you know kind of the simple guy. And we loved him. He's just a simple thinker. I wish I had some of that. And uh, my dad comes in and he's like, people like me, we make the world spin. And my friend from Arkansas, he goes, <laughs> well, then make it stop. And I was like, the brilliance, you know? And uh, his dad walked out. He was like, you're not getting the point. But he thought, you know, people in business, we make the world spin. Yeah, well, we, we interchange pictures of paper with denominations that were invented by man. No, something else makes the world spin. Because after I'm gone, it's going to keep spinning. Before I was here, it was still spinning. And then we look at it, we're like, ah, perspective. I never thought that perspective when I was drinking. That's what kept me drunk. It's like, oh, I, I'm in so much control of this stuff. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, with that... Hope you guys enjoyed our talk. Head over to TalkSober.com. Support the channel by clicking the big yellow button. Sign up for less than a dollar a day. You support what we're doing. And hopefully, one day, I'll have the last chapter of the book in there for you. But you got to go sign up to find out. You know, there you go. It's like a surprise. But uh, it really helps us out because right now we are running. Uh, it does cost a lot to have stuff going on and things like that. We make a little bit but not much. So help us out. Get some good stuff. There's all kinds of good sobriety tools in there. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Great chat today.